So I love this painting by Vincent van Gogh. I actually have it hanging in my office. Well, a copy of it, of course. <laughs> hanging in my office. It was one of the last paintings that he did shortly before he died. And I love the bold colors and I love the brush strokes. But what I love the most about this painting is the story that it represents. It is based on the Good Samaritan, which is a story that Jesus shared when he was asked about what it means to love your neighbor. And let me just read it to you very briefly, uh, what Jesus replied when he was asked what it means to love your neighbor. I recently started using reading glasses. <laughs> oh, it helps so much. <laughs> Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus ended his story by asking, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied correctly, the one who had mercy on him. So Jesus said, go and do likewise. So according to Jesus, what it means to love our neighbor involves interrupting our lives in a costly manner for a complete stranger. Interrupting our lives in a costly manner for a complete stranger. I love that Jesus doesn't sugarcoat this. Right? Jesus is very clear and direct. No sugarcoating. This is what it means to love your neighbor. And according to Jesus, loving your neighbor means wrapping your arms around someone when it's really difficult to do so. This is actually something that I really appreciate about this painting. Notice how the Samaritan is struggling to wrap his arms around a person in need. His back is bent, his foot is lifted, there's a grimace on his face. This painting, I think, very accurately depicts what it means to wrap our arms around someone that is truly in need. Which is why I think it's so perfect that the program that Marilyn mentioned earlier that HISD is working on, on wrap around services, I have no idea how you all arrived at that name, but it's perfect. Wrap around services, this is the image that comes to my mind when I hear that term, wrap around services because it is, the, the needs are so great, and that, therefore it is extremely challenging to truly wrap our arms around those in need. What HISD is working on right now, by the way, I, if I may add a little bit more to what Marilyn mentioned earlier, is truly taking on the challenge of providing needs that serve students' most basic needs because they recognize that students cannot learn unless their most basic needs are met. And those needs are huge. I hope that, that some of you all understand, in HISD, which is the largest school district in Texas and the seventh largest district in the country, they have over 208,000 students. 80% of them are economically disadvantaged. A huge majority of our state's largest school district are economically disadvantaged. Over 9,000 of them are homeless. And by the way, student homelessness increased tremendously after Harvey. Uh, understandably, there are still many families struggling with those effects. 
So the needs are huge. And what HISD is trying to do at this point is that it's actually, I would say, the nation's most ambitious program in addressing these needs. They are investing millions of dollars to make sure that every single one of their 280 or plus campuses has a wraparound specialist on that campus and making sure that they are really reaching out to these students and meeting their needs. And furthermore, these campuses are going to be producing reports that list the specific needs on each campus. I'm going to ask the HIC representatives to please raise their hands once again. Look around, look at them. Be sure to talk to them to make sure that the work that your churches are doing, that you, get, that you have access to this information that specifies the needs that they have because there's a lot of work to be done there and I think this is a great opportunity for us to get involved. Especially in the season of giving, let's focus on giving truly meaningful gifts and, and this is the kind of gift that I think could be really meaningful. And by the way, I would like to add that when we give resources to these churches to meet these kinds of needs, we're not only meeting their physical needs, that's just the beginning of the story, <coughs> we're actually having a life-changing impact on the students that receive these gifts. When I was in high school, I received these gifts from members of my church who were school teachers, and they showed up unannounced at my house with groceries. And they, I remember they just walked in, went straight to my kitchen, and started unpacking those groceries. And I remember thinking, wow, somebody cared. You're not just filling their stomachs, you're changing their hearts. When children see you serve in this way, you are changing their lives, because that changed my life. It changed my heart, because what's worse than having these basic needs is feeling that no one cares. And that changed my heart. So I love this concept of wraparound services and I strongly encourage you all to make an effort to wrap around these children in this manner. But this story is not just about the Good Samaritan, it's also about the religious leaders who passed by and crossed over to the other side of the road. This is a story about religious people deliberately separating themselves from people in need. Now why would, why would a religious leader do that? Did y'all wonder? I hope you wondered about that when I read that story, because that's just weird. <laughs> it turns out there's a reason. They had a reason for doing that. The first religious leader was a priest. And priests had very strict rules about purity and cleanliness, which meant they could not touch a corpse. This, so, so this priest chose not to take a risk of defiling himself when he saw this man lying on the side of the road and therefore crossed over to the other side. Then came the Levite, which is sort of like a priest's assistant, so the rules weren't as strict for the Levite, but he also chose to cross over to the other side of the road. He also chose not to take a risk. But Jesus is telling us very clearly through this story that love supersedes purity and cleanliness. Love supersedes these concerns. In fact, Jesus is making very clear through this story, I think it's, 
he's reminding <coughs> us that we need to think about how we today, as religious people of today, are also, have, we have deep down a desire to separate ourselves. We are just as segregated <coughs> as we were before the civil rights movement. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because this is still something that we are struggling with today. I love the work that Loving Houston is doing. I love it. I Please don't misinterpret anything that I am saying right now. This is incredible. But if we are to take it to the next level, if we are to love like Jesus loved, we need to consider the ways in which we are acting like the priest and the Levite in separating ourselves and worse, using our religion as an excuse. We're still very segregated. So, and there's still a lot of separation between private schools and public schools. And there's a lot of separation within public school districts as well as between public school districts. So I want to show you a map that was created by my research team showing <coughs> the level of segregation that we have here today. This is based on the most recent academic, I keep pointing this way, based on the most recent academic year, these are the 21 school districts in Harris County. And each district shows the percentage of white students enrolled. And you see a very clear pattern where the districts in the center of Harris County have an underrepresentation of white students, and the districts in the periphery of the county have an overrepresentation <coughs> of white students. And there are many specific examples where there are neighboring districts. We have like, so like HIC is 9% white. Did I mention earlier, it's 208,000 students the state's largest district is 9% white. A-Leaf ISD is 4% white. Aldean ISD is 2% white. And then you see very clearly where A-Leaf is neighboring with like Katy, which is 35% white, is a huge jump when you cross over to the other side. We are still crossing over to the other side, and the reason why this matters I mean, we just saw this morning, by the way, I don't know if any of you noticed the, one of the headlines in the New York Times this morning because the PISA scores came out, these are the international student assessments, showing how poorly we're doing in the United States, especially when it comes to the gaps. Our gaps are still growing. And I have, there's a whole body of research that not just my research, research from colleagues in other places, one of my colleagues at Stanford in particular has produced a lot of research showing that the number one predictor of those gaps is segregation. I think Jesus was onto something when he pointed out how important it is to avoid this desire that we have, that, that we just want to separate ourselves from people in need. And it's tricky because it's there even when we send assistance. Even when we're sending money, we're sending our resources. And I, I want to make clear once again, I want to encourage you all to keep doing that. That is so important. That is so meaningful. Please don't stop. But we've got to do something about this. Because as long as this continues, all of that help that we're sending is not going to solve the problems. The problems are going to continue as long as we keep separating ourselves. So I want to encourage all of us, myself included, all of us to think about this story in this way, applying it to us here and now, especially when it comes to education, and ask ourselves, are we following the example of the Samaritan? And I think that we are, we are heading in the right direction there. But are we also avoiding the example of the priest and the Levite? 
Because until we do that, we cannot truly live up to our name, loving Houston, to love Houston in the way that Jesus taught us to love. Thank you.